on TikTok, it's easy for you to go over there and comment on there. Um, or uh, if you just need this different space, like it becomes too weird in here or something, because it often becomes too weird in here, doesn't it? I don't know what it is about me that just make people attack me right and left. Uh, I don't care so much, but it, it does weird and it does get hard. I think for others more so than for myself, though. I mean, I'm often, uh, I respond too much. Hello, everybody. I like weird too. For weird people, it's normal people. Normal people scare me. They're kind of fucked. Um, so it's, it's totally down for me. Um, we're going to talk probably a lot about paleoanthropology over the next couple of weeks just to try and get it back up there. I'm just trying to, you know, ensure that we have um, that thought process going. Um, and because there's a lot that I see within paleoanthropology that really um, speaks to us today, right? That really speaks to who we need to be today. Um, you know, Solomon, I understand why you made that comment. Uh, but it's not with this picture. Um, so this picture is Homo erectus. And we know that uh, at 900,000 years ago is where the uh, light skin allele starts in Homo erectus. But they had like a million years on this planet before they had that. Uh, so we're definitely seeing that Homo erectus for at least the first million years of their existence is dark skin. It is them who starts the light skin allele and they get that because they go across the globe and in spaces where you need light skin to survive, that's an adaptation that Homo erectus has. Uh, but we all start black. <laughs> the entire species started black. Um, and, you know, there's this, um, history with an anthropology and archaeology to, uh, you know, kind of make it into racism, right? Because anthropology and archaeology and its conception in its early space uh, was absolutely a very racist uh, community and absolutely was used very much to double down on the racism that was already within most societies. Uh, but this picture itself uh, is a as accurate of a rendition as we have of early Homo erectus. Uh, fossils can tell us skin color based on, uh, depending on whether or not we can get the DNA from it, right? We do not have uh, DNA from Homo erectus. The reason that they know that uh, the light skin allele starts at 900,000 years ago is because what they have been doing lately with DNA is they can take the DNA and they can trace specific things and... Um, I don't understand it enough to be able to give the fine details of it, but they can trace generations. And by tracing generations of specific things, they're able to trace a timeline on specific things. And so probably six months ago, a couple months ago, they came out with an article, um, a scientific journal article that talks about they've traced the start of the light skin allele to 900,000 years ago. Um, at 900,000 years ago, it would be Homo erectus. There's nobody else really that uh, we would have descended from that it would be. I'm not even sure Hadelbergensis was around 900,000 years ago. I'd have to double down on that to give a def definitive. Um, but we do know that Homo erectus for a million point one years uh, did not have the light skin allele because, again, we've been able to trace the timeline on the light skin allele. Um, we're also able to trace the timeline on eyes. We're also able to trace the timeline on when certain mitochondrial and why DNA uh, started, right? Uh, so I'd love to see that article, Erica. Um, from what I've read of, of articles, uh, they have been able to tell those things. Uh, that does not mean that newer information hasn't changed that, right? Uh, but to what I understand from the latest articles I've seen, and, and that the light skin allele article was a very recent one, um, that they are able to trace those things. And I do understand that, like, the reason that we know that the whole, the oldest uh, person, the oldest indigenous Australian goes back 70,000 years is because they're able to trace the generations of the split between the indigenous Australians DNA and the other DNA's uh, DNA lineages on the planet, right? Because all DNA goes through lineages, like mitochondrial DNA is the mother's lineage, Y DNA is the father's lineage. And when they look at those lineages, they're able to trace generations, they're able to trace, well, they're now able to trace like when the dark skin allele come or, uh, was gone within Europe, or, you know, when uh, we see those changes within us, right? And they're able to chase it. Uh, that may be too, Erica. And
a lot of, you know, so much information is so new. Like we have literally in the last 10 years, we've found four species <laughs> since 2010. Um, in the last 20 years, we have found five other species that we live with, plus the six species that we see in our DNA that are ghost species, right? So in the last 20 years, we've literally found like 11 other species. In the last 10 years, since 2010, when we found Denisovian, we found Denisovian, Nelotti, Luzonzensis, Longi, and uh, uh, no, those four, right? Because we found Florenzis in 2003, right? So there's just so much popping out. And like, it's only been within the last year that Lee Berger put out the information that Nalotti uh, buried their dead, right? So all of it is really, you know, so recent within this field. Um, and really what it is, is as science is progressing and allowing non-white old men into it, they're really, really getting more information. The kelp highway theory is, um, and there was actually an article I saw Come out like yesterday about it. Uh, the kelp highway theory uh, talks about uh, people making it from Asia across the northern uh, sea route. Um, and instead of, so for the longest time, we thought, not we, um, Turtle Islanders have known this different. Like uh, indigenous people to the Americas have known that this is incorrect. White academic has thought that. Uh, Turtle Island indigenous people have only been here 12,000 years. They uh, call it the Clovis first theory. Clovis is still not debunked. Clovis is absolutely a beautiful culture of people, but the idea that the Clovis were the first people here has been debunked. Um, and they uh, used the Clovis first theory in what they call the uh, Bering Lamb Bridge, right? Um, and what the Bering Lamb Bridge is, is the idea that there's an ice-free corridor uh, across, uh, well, see, Beringia is like this entire continent for a while, right? Uh, but across Beringia, there's this ice-free corridor that is open between 18 and 15,000 years ago. Um, and we now know that people have been in the Turtle Islands longer than 18,000 years. We now have discoveries that have pushed it back to 33,000 years for Homo sapien and 130,000 years for a species that comes from Homo erectus. Uh, so when we're looking at that, we realize that the Bering Land Bridge, well, there are people who very obviously came across from the Bering Land Ridge, Bridge just because of the way the DNA works and just because of finds that they found, right? Um, we also know that the Bering Land Bridge is like the last route, right? Um, one of the routes that they know of is called the Kelp Highway. Uh, this is something that they have really put a lot into probably the last five years. They weren't really putting a lot into it before that, but over the last five years, they've really put a lot into it. And the Kelp Highway talks about people coming on boats and basically island hopping along the northern part of the Pacific uh, Ocean. So along North uh, West Asia, over, uh, you know, where we see the, the tip of Russia and then the tip of Alaska, right? And then down. And so what the Kelp Highway is, is a uh, theory. Uh, and so we know that like uh, Japanese have had boats for like 20,000 years, 21,000 years. So this theory uh, integrates that knowledge of boats. Um, we now know Neanderthals have boats and Homo erectus have boats, but this uh, integrates that knowledge of sailing that is really, really early on. And it integrates uh, the knowledge of the sea that indigenous people around the globe really have, especially if they're island-based or they're coastal-based. And it also um, really shows that knowledge of the world that so many indigenous people have prior to colonization. And basically all the Kelp Highway is saying, they have a lot of finds along the Kelp Highway. Um, and then basically all of those finds are like on islands, uh, in caves on islands, basically. Uh, some of them are way up in like Greenland, like up a north of Canada, excuse me, up north of Canada. But what it states is that instead of using the Bering Land Bridge, uh, they um, cross along that northern route and they follow what they call the Kelp Highway. Um, this is probably, and I, I haven't done a lot of research on the Kelp Highway. I've actually put more into the southern boat route, uh, but this is likely because there's an association of the way that the kelp flows in the water and an understanding that indigenous people um, had an understanding of the different ways that they could use uh, all of the elements that they get from the world around them. And so many indigenous people really use kelp as a food source, right? And so this kind of doubles down on that thought process and is showing a route that uses that as a food source and uses it as a travel because 
um, when you're looking at water flow, the kelp is flowing along the water flow routes, right? So uh, all oceans have these different channels of flow through them. Um, we know like Polynesians can taste the water and know which channel they're in, like just brilliant. Um, this actually theoretically states that they're traveling along the kelp highway because watching the kelp flows tells them that there's that flow in the water so they can travel along that flow while it's providing a food source as they're moving across. Seaweed is delicious. I love seaweed. Hello, everybody. Um, so the kelp highway is one of the two currently, ex uh, well, the kelp highway is completely accepted. Uh, the southern boat route, uh, I've been talking about it for like five, 10 years, but they're just now coming out with papers that show that there is a Southern boat route, right? Uh, and the Southern boat route shows through uh, Denisovian DNA. And it also, um, because where the largest presence of Denisovian DNA is, is down in uh, Southwest Asia and down in Austronesia and down in those islands down there. But then you also get Denisovian DNA in, in the uh, Americas. This idea is that they have a boat route that island hops the South Pacific. Um, when you're looking at the South Pacific and the Ring of Fire, and this includes the North Pacific and the Kelp uh, Highway, uh, the water levels when you have a glacial maximum are lower because all the uh, water is caught in the ice when you have a glacial maximum. So you're getting continents and islands that we don't see today. They actually, like in the last six months, discovered a continent that they thought didn't exist, even though it's been documented for years. But because of the way the water rose, that continent is just a small little stick up now. And so they're like, oh, that continent doesn't exist. And then they're like, oh, wait, shit, we're wrong. That continent existed. Um, and so, so much of the Pacific uh, is especially within that ring of fire where islands are always uh, coming about and going away, coming about and going away. Um, we're seeing that uh, people have been there longer than we thought, A. Eh? Uh, people have been traveling over water longer than we thought. Luzon, Luzon Zenzis in uh, the Philippines and Florensis uh, in the uh, Indonesian islands both show cross of water by Homo erectus, right? And that's before we get to things like the Ceruti Mastodon find that was mentioned in um, the comments and the Moy Hill site in Australia, which both show Homo erectus making it to both uh, North America with the Ceruti Mastodon find in Australia for the Moy Hill site. These things, um, even before we found these things, uh, this understanding of what the ring of fire is, that volcanic action in this ring in the Pacific shows us that so many islands within the Pacific uh, come and go, right? When I was in school, uh, one of uh, the people that I really had a lot of love and respect for, one of my uh, mentors was, uh, he studies uh, the South Pacific. He's currently, I can't remember where he was right off the top of my head, but he was studying fish bones. And in that, I asked him, I'm like, well, how do you decide that Polynesians have only been there for 2,500 years? Why do you think that as indigenous people, Polynesians are only 2,500 years old? And he said, because that's how long the islands have been there, which to me... <laughs> <laughs> along with all the other information, shows jack shit. Um, I believe that if we've got a bunch of islands that are coming and going, it's quite possible that the Polynesians have been there for 30,000 years, right? It's just as the islands that they were on earlier have sunk underneath the waves and we haven't gotten them, right? So they are in the islands that they're in for 2,500 years because those islands are only 2,500 years old, right? Uh, we also see like there was an island coming up out of the water, like developing in front of your eyes on YouTube about five years ago. Um, there are constantly islands that we know that are sinking underneath the water. Um, and so we see that uh, the mix or the, the rise and the fall of the islands within the South Pacific really happens quite frequently. Um, and this gives weight to that knowledge that A, we could cross water, and B, uh, people are here way earlier than the Bering Land Bridge would have allowed capability for, uh, and C, that that crossing of water and that understanding of water, and with those islands coming and going, the kelp route and the southern, or the kelp highway and the southern boat route are absolutely not only feasible, but way more likely, right? You can't think like, if the Bering Land Bridge is only open from 18 to 15,000 years ago with that ice free corridor, but we know that people have been here for 33,000 years, well, how did they get here, right? How, how did they get here if that's, you know? So when we're looking at this, this just pushes back a lot of our dating. 
And in pushing back, a lot of our dating also really proves to a lot of indigenous histories, which we should have been listening to all along, right? Um, and when we're looking at the Cerruti Mastodon find in the Moyhill site, this doubles down on our knowledge currently that Homo erectus cross water. Like we can currently look at Homo erectus and see that Homo erectus crosses water to go to the island of Flores in Indonesia, which is within the Wallace Trench. And the Wallace Trench has never been above sea level. It's one of those deep parts in the ocean that's never been above sea level. So that island has always been an island. We've always had to cross water to get to it. The same thing with the island of Luzon in the Philippines. It is below the Wallace Trench. So you had to cross that water to get to it. Even if that whole thing below the Wallace Trench was a continent at some point. It still had to cross the Wallace Trench to get to it, okay? So it's also known as the Wallace Line. Um, and you'll see where they talk about uh, a couple different continents. This line is where we show uh, different species developed above this line than below this line, basically. And that is another thing of this line has always been there. So anything below that line had to cross water to get there, which means indigenous Australians crossed water 70,000 years ago to get to Australia, right? But we also absolutely see that Homo erectus had to cross water to the, get to the Moyhill site, to get to the Ceruti Mastodon site, and to get to Luzon's and to in uh, Flores, right? We've also recently had a discovery of... Uh, Neanderthals crossing water. I can't remember that whole article off the top of my head, so I'm not going to go um, into it completely. Um, but we do have a recent discovery that shows that Neanderthal was able to cross water too. Uh, so I think that we've probably really been crossing water the vast majority of our time as a species, right? Uh, because we had those tools when we came about. There's a couple of recent articles that talk about us coming from Homo erectus, but coming from two separate distinct groups. Um, which is all in South Africa still, um, but it's all that mixing. And one of the ideas that we have uh, such a great genetic diversity compared to the other homo species, the other human species, is uh, based on the idea that instead of one group of Homo erectus being, uh, you know, the, the originators of us, that it's a couple of groups of Homo erectus that are the originators of us, uh, which gives us that greater deal of genetic diversity than we have. And so it is fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. And I, I'm pretty sure you know what it suggests. I just want to make sure everybody knows what it means, right? Like, not trying to school. I just want to make sure that all the information is out there because I know that there's a lot of people that just don't have all the information, right? Um, so when we're looking at that, what we're looking at really doubles down on the idea that we are constantly moving constantly moving. That's really one of the important things about Homo erectus, really one of the important things about sapien. We are two species that, <laughs> we are one of two species that are, yeah, one of two species that actually makes it across the globe. No other species really makes it across the globe the way Homo erectus and Homo sapien does. These are really important parts about us as uh, humans, right? This is um, one of the major things that makes us who we are today, right? Uh, our ability to adapt to whatever area we go into, right? And our ability to uh, move long distances. Uh, we, I've heard it referred to as expedient bipedalism, and I really love that theory and thought. And what it is, is that unlike other species, our bipedalism uh, really is set for long range travel. We're really set up to be able to move over long range. And Homo erectus is the same way. It's really set up physically to be able to move over a long range of people, right? Or a long range of area. Uh, it is what gives us all the other species that we mixed with, all the other species that we lived with. Uh, all of these things coming from Homo erectus is really because Homo erectus can make it across the globe. Um, and our ability to interact with all of these other species, our ability to uh, get DNA from some of these other species, our ability to ourselves make it across the globe comes from Homo erectus. And it really comes from things like that light skin allele coming in at 900,000 years ago. That light skin allele gave Homo erectus the abilities to subsist in a cloud cover environment um, when they are a species that develops in a no cloud color cover environment, right? That adaptation of our bodies to the environment that we're in. <laughs> oh, 
Will the species of podcast men just not be able to breed and become extinct soon? Hoping. <laughs> I actually saw a video a while ago. Uh, Eliza Sloshinger, uh, who's a great comedian, uh, was talking and she said directly to incels. And she's like, listen, what this is, is you've proven that you're not capable of like, you're just not going to continue your genes. Like you've proven that you don't have the capability to continue your genes. So just deal with the fact that nobody wants to fuck you. Right. <laughs> Um, because I, I agree with that stuff. I think that um, we have a lot of people, uh, a lot of groups that uh, seem to have gotten a lot of the genetic negatives, right? And, uh, you know, for the longest time, we bred with the narcissists because they were the God Kings. And if we bred with the narcissists, then we could ensure our survival as a person, right? If you marry a King, then you're going to eat, right? And your children are going to eat, right? And so in breeding with the narcissistic God Kings, we've kind of proliferated narcissism and megalomania and, and the dark triad within our species because we've bred it into our species, right? And so now we're really kind of breeding that out of our species, I hope. Like, we bred it in, let's get rid of it. Uh, but absolutely, uh, I think people like that, like Andrew Tate, uh, they can all go to the wayside. We're done with them. <laughs> we don't have a need for them. And we've grown and learned that uh, just because somebody screams loud does not mean that their voice is right, right? Just because you're screaming at the top of your lungs doesn't mean anybody should be listening. Um, had another experience with that today. It does seem to me, though, that there is quite a large content of humans that think that the louder they scream, the more you should listen. Well, they're not offering any actual like benefit to their screaming. <laughs> like, but yeah, I do believe we're breeding them. Well, and you know, I think that honestly, I think that there's a lot of things that are going to be essential for our species as we're moving forward. And one of those things that's going to be really essential for our species as we're moving forward is returning tenderness and tending and governance to indigenous groups across the world, because as we're causing climate destruction, it's only that returning of tending and governance to indigenous peoples across the globe that's going to lessen that, right? That's going to make that uh, go away, I'm going to change the climate destruction. And unless we can change the climate destruction, we're literally destroying our livability as a species. Um, I am off track because we were talking about erectus to start with, but uh, all of these things are really important. So it's not bothering me. But I do want to go ahead and talk somewhat about Erectus, about the species that predates us, about the things that we know about the species that predates us that we all kind of descend from. Now, Homo erectus is not considered to be our, our they're our direct ancestor, but they're not like our parent ancestor, right? When we do change with the environment, but only so much, right? So if we lose our ability to breathe and we haven't changed that out, we've got to come up with ways to breathe. That doesn't mean that, you know, we won't. We have a, so much technology, though I do think that there are better ways than just trying to, you know, make it so we can all breathe. Uh, I do think that, you know, we need to actually, I think we need to change the way that we're doing things, right? Hello, beautiful. I think we need to change the way we're doing things. And the reason I think that we need to change the way that we're doing things is because I believe that if something is proven to be destructive, then it's time to stop. And Western agriculture has proven to be destructive since its first inception. The first time Western agriculture was a city-based thing, it, it caused, caused climate destruction. Viruses do alter our DNA. Um, not only do viruses alter our DNA, but experience alters our DNA, right? Um, like that's that epigenetic things that we've been talking about a lot lately, not necessarily me, but like as a whole, the epigenetic shows that the things that have... Um, things carry on in our DNA. So if something happened to your grandmother, it's in your DNA, right? Um, and we see that, um, we see that diet is huge in it too, right? Um, if you take somebody whose diet has been very nature-based for generations and generations, and then you start feeding them commodity food, it, they're going to reject the uh, chemicals in the commodity food and the things that don't uh, actually feed them in commodity food. And so you're going to get larger people because their bodies are shuffling that somewhere else, right? Because it's not something they need. Yeah, all generational trauma, right? Um, and so we see absolutely within this that all of these things really matter in who we are today. All of these things really matter in... in how our, how our sense of self reacts, right? We talk a lot about, you know, uh, 
the violence and the abuse that we have in childhood really affects um, us, us as adults, right? We talk a lot about breaking generational trauma and things like that. But what we don't really understand, it seems, or we're just starting to understand, it seems, and some of us do understand, um, is that not just what your grandmother or what your mother is doing to you, but what your mother's 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 mother, who neither of you ever met, did to her children um, is reflected in, in that pass down. So your body may react on a cellular level to things from generations ago, right? I need to step away for like two seconds. I will be right back. Go ahead and continue to comment and I'll read them in just a second. Sorry, I hadn't quite yet medicated today and I needed to take care of that. Um, when we're looking at Homo erectus, um, one thing that I always like to point out is that we're looking at the species that gave us fire. I know, right? <laughs> we're looking at the species that gave us fire. Uh, <coughs> we're looking at the species that really gives us the foundation of everything you have, right? Homo erectus is the first species that we have that's able to, <laughs> that's able to, um, really, uh, control or use fire, right? Have, um, create fire for usage, right? Um, and because of that, what we're seeing is there's a lot of things that that passes down to us, not just technology, right? But also the the ability to grow larger brains, um, also better hunting tools. Um, I always like to point out that this is an indigenous science. When we're looking at the ability to have fire, what we're looking at is indigenous science in action. Science in its base, is um, I see it in nature. I think of what that thought process might mean, like I uh, hypothesize what that what I saw might mean. I predict how I can work with it. I test how I can work with it. And if those tests proves true, then I have a theory or a working object, right? If those tests prove false, I have to go back to my hypothesis and rethink through this process. Now, when we're looking at early science like um, fire or tool making, first, we've realized recently that we, Homo species aren't the creators of the first tools. Uh, Paranthropus boisei, which is a hominin, but not a Homo species, uh, actually is the first tool maker. Uh, this is the Nutcracker Man, and this is um, three, three million, 300,000 years old, 33, 3,300,000. 3.3, that's what I want, 3.3 million years ago. Um, and we found this find really recently, it came across the news um, and it is a find that includes hippo bones and they were butchering hippos. Um, so homos are hominins, but in a taxonomy, there's levels basically, right? Um, or in a family tree. And so we know now that we're not quite a tree, we're more a web. And we know now that the taxonomy it's kind of funky, but sometimes it really makes it easier to explain. So um, chimpanzees and, oh, let me see if I, this is going to pause me for a second. I'm going to see if I've got what I want and I'll, I'll pop it up. But when I do this, it has a tendency to pause the live. So I will be right back. Maybe if I can find it, because some days it should be, there it is. They changed it. Um, Okay, come on, give it to me. Sorry if you're on YouTube, you are still seeing me <laughs> or kind of seeing me. Um, let me 
find it again. It was just there and it didn't let me click on it. I hope it's not too far back to let me click on it. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Okay, so when we're looking at taxonomy, um, it has different levels. I'll put me down here, actually. We'll do it like this. It has different levels of uh, species, right? So you're going to go all the way back to mammals, the kingdom mammalia. Uh, no, it's the kingdom. I think kingdom is animal versus plant, but I can't remember. But all of these things go on levels like this. Our um, family is where homo comes in. Our species, maybe it's tribe, I'm bad at the taxonomy, is where sapien comes in. Now this um, doesn't show all the way up like the other one I have does, but this one does give uh, it, it comparisons, right? So um, we are the homo species under the hominini, um, or we're the homo tribe under the hominini sub-tribe. No, homo is sub-tribe, hominini is tribe, okay? And uh, uh, above hominini is hominine, hominine. Um, and then there's another one, hominoid. They're fucking hard to pronounce, Latin sucks ass. Um, but these are what we consider like the levels of um, branches out. How we determine who our cousins are, how we determine who our parents are, how we could determine who our children are, basically. This is our human family tree. Hey. And so as we are a homo species, um, well, the family, the, the, the taxonomy is like 1850. Taxonomy has been around forever, um, but certain things have absolutely changed within it. Um, and this taxonomy is, is just showing a chunk, not the whole taxonomy. Uh, but homo and pan are both hominines. This one specifically is showing um, Graciopithecus fribergi. So Graciopithecus fribergi is thought to be uh, a, a missing link, one of the missing links between us and our closest cousins, which is chimpanzee. Chimpanzee is under the family pan, like we're under the, and I think it's family, it's either family or tribe, uh, homo. So we and Erectus, uh, Rudolfensis, Neanderthalus, Florensis are all under the homo label. And then our species is that other thing. And um, when we're looking at uh, pan, chimpanzee is one of the species under it. There's other species, I believe, like two or three, not a whole lot. If I remember correctly, remember, I don't study other species. I only study homo species. Paranthropus boisei is on the same level as Homo and Pan, um, just like Graciopithecus fribergi is on the same level as Hominini and Gorillian, right? So after Hominini, which is where we get to uh, mostly upright, right? Uh, Seven million years ago, we got Saleoanthropus tadichi in um, South Africa, which is our first knowledge of a fully upright because of the placement of the hole in the skull, the foramen magna, uh, he would be Saleoanthropus is going to be next to Homo and Pan on this tree, right? Um, so would uh, Paranthropus, which is Paranthropus boisei. Um, oh God, I'm not gonna be able to name half of them, but so would several others. Um, and I could be wrong, on some of these, like one of them might be a step above. I'm only really sure on the ones that get closer to us. But Paranthropus boisei is, as far as I can remember, under hominini. 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 I can never pronounce the Latin of these. I do not like Latin. It is not one of my things. Let me actually double check what Paranthropus boisei's space on the family tree is. Before I give the information, I don't want to be giving the incorrect information on it.
We do know that they're a cousin that goes further back, which I was trying, I did mean to say earlier, but I didn't. Um, we do know that they're a cousin species, but the cousin is like a step up. They're not cousin close, like a uh, cousin, like uh, uh, other homo species are. And because they don't have a close common ancestor, it's not like we could interbreed with them, but they're way back. Nope. Nope. That is not giving me the taxonomy. So it's giving me the class, the family. So the family is the orange one above us. But the way that they're giving it makes it really hard to see on this. Let me try. I'm trying to do something that's not Wikipedia because it's Wikipedia. This might give. Okay, so they are hominin. hominin. Um, yeah, so they are. Um, I can't remember if it's up above or not, where hominin is in the uh, family tree. So I think that hominin and hominini are the same, but I can't remember. And I think it's just the uh, spelling for everybody versus the really tight Latin spelling of it. Um, but I can't remember. Again, not my best um, understanding once we get out of human, early hominin, hominin. Yes. Okay. So it's an early hominin. So they are on the same hominin scale as us, but where we say homo and they say pan, it says paranthropus. And then other paranthropus under paranthropus would go boisei, just like where it says homo under homo would go erectus, um, and, uh, sapien and sapien sapien and um, Neanderthal, right? This is gonna take, it shouldn't actually take a minute for me to get back out of this. It might, cause I had other shit up today. Yeah, okay, so uh, it'll freeze me for just a second. I know you're still seeing me YouTube and I probably have my hand in front of you, don't I? I apologize. I apologize. I hate when I can't find the images. I have so many screenshots in here. Ha ha ha. I can't see what I want to find. So we'll just go to this because it has information that we want. Um, so uh, when we're looking at Paranthropus boisei, uh, we're seeing that Paranthropus boisei is um, an older species in the first branch of human, Homo, and an older species than, um, well, it's older than a lot of the other ones. It's it's roughly the same time as Lucy is, right? The Australopithecine species, right? Um, and so when we're looking at that, we're absolutely seeing that um, Lucy is or that this species at the same time as Lucy is using tools. And they're not just using tools, they're using the old one tool complex. And the old one, I've seen some people that absolutely look like, this is Neanderthal though, right? Um, so uh, the old one complex is actually uh, quite a bit, it's our first tool complex that we have. Uh, it consists of what we call cobblestones, which are usually flatter stones that you place something on and hammer stones, which are uh, large stones that you're cracking shit with. Um, and they're also uh, associated with uh, scrapers, right? Um, to my knowledge, this is the only thing with an old wand tool complex. I could, there might be like some blade assemblages, but I can't remember. They would be just hand blades for cutting if there are. When we go from the old one tool complex to the um, Acheulean tool assemblage, our Acheulean tool complex, um, is when we see the shift from what Paranthropus boisei brought about, what Homo habilis, the first human species that we recognize as human, because they created tools, we thought, so they might not be Homo habilis. Handyman is the name of the species. Um, what Handyman used um, didn't change from what Paranthropus boisei creates. And as far as we know, creates. Again, this field changes constantly right now, right? So um, when we are 
uh, looking at that change of the tool assemblage in Homo erectus, we see that first spark of change. We see that first, I am taking something that has been adapted. Animals adapt all the time. Animals use tools all the time. Animals will create tools. Crows will uh, piece together two or more straws to create a long tubular thing to get things, right? We've done studies on this and I've seen videos on it where they'll take several different pieces of assemblage and put them together to get to things, right? So even crows will assemble tools, right? Um, when we look at uh, the beaver, the beaver's been making the same dam and den for as long as the beavers existed pretty much. Um, and we see that other uh, hominini species uh, are able to use tools uh, like rocks. Uh, we've even seen like spears, sticks from um, like chimpanzees and gorillas, especially from chimpanzees when they're getting to food sources because you can use a long stick to dig into like a termite mound um, and many other examples of adapting your surroundings or using tools are seen across the animal kingdom. We are not unique in that. We're not even unique. The animal kingdom's not even unique because we see that um, trees adapt their surroundings to make it better, right? To give more of a home for themselves, right? Same thing with plants and flowers, right? So adapting your surroundings is not unique even to the animal kingdom, but it is definitely not unique to us. What is really unique to us is adapting our adaptations. Looking at something and going, that works, but I can make it work better. And we look at things and we go, that works, but I can make it work better. And it is that shift from the old one tools to the Acheulean hand axe assemblage that is really that, that works, but I can make it work better that we see. And in that, that works, but I can make it work better that we see, we see the foundation of everything. And that is science in its base, right? Again, I see it. I hypothesize what my thought means. I predict what that hypothesis will do and I test it. And if it works, it's come into play as a tool or something else, right? An adaptation of an adaptation, or it's, um, you know, testing has proven true. It becomes a theory if we're looking at it as uh, verbal instead of like actual hands-on. When we're looking at it hands-on, we see that Homo erectus adapting its adaptations adapts from Paranthropus boisei, old one tool complex, into the Acheulean tool complex. And the Acheulean tool complex is where we see the Acheulean hand axe come in. To me, it looks like a scraper sometimes when it's a little bit smaller, um, but I absolutely see the hand axe properties of it. It is teardrop shaped with the point on the bottom and you can pick it up and hold it here or hold it like this and go crack, 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 right? You could also do this and slice, right? Um, kind of like an ulu, uh, but not rounded like an ulu, obviously, but, you know, kind of like a, you know, a multiple tool here, right? We do not see that this is used for spears. We do not see that this is used really as a hunting tool, but more as a processing tool, more as a creating for process tool. We can see, though, that you're going to get a pretty solid spear out of fire. And the way that fire gives you a pretty solid uh, spear if you were a child that liked to f around with your friends, maybe stab your brothers a couple times, you might have noticed that if you sharpen the tip of a piece of wood, um, green to hard, you know, it doesn't matter, sharpen the tip of a piece of wood and you go to hit a hard surface with it, that surface is going, or that point is going to mushroom. That point mushrooms because by sharpening it with a uh, knife, you've broken the uh, integrity of the piece of wood. And in breaking and damaging that integrity, it doesn't hold that point. But if you take that same piece of wood and you heat it in the fire or next to the fire, and then you roll it away, and then you heat it again and you roll it away, that action of heating and rolling it, I had a fidget, is called tempering. That action of heating and rolling it that's called tempering really hardens it. We use tempering when we work with metals. We work, use tempering to this day. And we get our hardest metals out of tempering. We get our hardest woods out of tempering. So if you're tempering that wood, you take that uh, stick that may have been a little bit more pliable or a little bit you know, more breakable, and you really give some stability and some sturdiness to it. And then if you take and you stick that tip in the fire and you kind of let it burn just a little bit, not a whole lot, you know, 
uh, maybe catch on fire, but not burn down. And then you take it and you kind of uh, grind it against the rocks of the side of the fire. You're going to get a piece of wood that has been tempered, that's hard, that works really well uh, with a point that's hard and it's not going to explode. It's not going to push them out. You're going to be able to actually puncture skin. Or you're going to actually be able to puncture hide. And so this gives a hunting tool that is not on the uh, assemblage before. We found out, the article came out like in the last week, that Neanderthals were using bone tools. We haven't attributed uh, Neanderthals bone tools as bone tools before because we thought we were the only species that ever used bone tools. And there are a lot of tools in the assemblage that we don't see because um, the archaeological record is biased. The earth itself will degrade certain things at a faster speed. Uh, it will degrade certain things in a slower speed, and it will do that in different environments differently. So if you're in a really cold, really dry environment like Otzi the Iceman, you're going to mummify, right? Uh, and, and freeze in a really good condition. If you're fully submerged like a bog body, uh, your DNA, the, the substance of you, all of this is going to last longer. But if you're left out exposed in the desert, nobody's going to find you a million years from now, right? You've got to be under something, right? So the durability of wood and bone tools for continuous hunting, because we're not finding these things in the fossil record, right? Um, Now, I know that we have found wood spears associated, I believe, with another hominin species, another hom uh, homo species. I, I do not remember off the top of my head if it is Neanderthal or Heidelbergensis. Mm, but because, again, this is something that's going to degrade in the fossil record, now that we have this new testing where we can test the ground for the DNA, have you seen that? Like they're testing ground and they can layer DNA layers in the ground. Like they pulled out 2 million years worth of DNA from the tundra, right? Uh, with Siberian tundra. So when we're this new tool, we might be able to find more of that. Like say we find uh, a cedar branch in a space that is no cedar, right? And the DNA from it has shifted from fire, right? That would give us a, an example of a spear being created, right? Um, we do know that they were using tools to create and using, or using tools to hunt, right? And we do know that the stone tools that they had would not have been hunting tools, right? Um, I extrapolate my knowledge on how to create a wooden spear to think of different ways that they could have created a wooden spear. Um, I would state that it's probably just as likely to uh, break in its shaft as, um, you know, a bone or a, a stone tip spear, right? Um, I would say that you'd probably have to fine it a bit or sand it a bit to keep its point in between hunts. But the shaft itself, we know that tempering shafts like that ha is what we've done with spears throughout history. So, yes. Okay, yes. So there is an article um, and I don't think I put it on my thing because it doesn't really relate to uh, humans. Uh, but there is an article where they look for oldest DNA found. And it will be 2 million years. And it's really, they did like a core sample and they DNA tested the core sample. And in DNA testing the core sample, they built the Siberian tundra, a vision of what this, what animals and what plants were on the Siberian tundra at 2 million years ago. This is just Max Planck Institute, right? Every since Fonte Pablo, the guy who won the Nobel Peace Prize last year for inventing uh, the, uh, my brain is not working its best, polymerase chain reaction uh, testing, which is uh, multiplication of DNA, basically. Uh, every since then, they've been coming up with new and new and new because uh, it's there. I mean, okay, so think of like a drop of blood on the earth. Um, if you can get that drop of blood off of the earth, then you're going to be able to extract strands of DNA from it, right? And if you can extract strands of DNA from it, yeah, but DNA lasts in non-living things, right? Okay, so uh, DNA, like any other chemical, has what we call a half-life. It's basically the rate of time it takes for it to degrade by half. So I'm going to use numbers that work for my using. If we have like 100 strands of DNA and the half-life for DNA is one day. That first day, we're going to lose 50 strands of our DNA, but we're going to keep the other 50 strands of our DNA. 
Uh, that second day, we're going to lose 25 strands of our DNA and keep 25 strands of our DNA. That third day, we're going to lose 12.5 and keep 12.5. And it just keeps going down, right? That, right? Um, and when we're looking at that, uh, again, when I was saying like certain things will last longer in certain situations, um, think of things like Otzi the Iceman, things like the bog bodies versus a uh, body you leave out in the middle of the desert. Uh, the body you leave out in the middle of the middle of the desert is probably going to be carted away by animals before it even gets to a skeletal point. But once it gets to a skeletal point, it's going to be windswept and windblown that so fast and so long that it's gone really quickly, right? Whereas a body that's freeze dried lasts, right? And the same with the DNA. Now, my numbers were completely off. I don't remember what DNA's half-life is off the top of my head. DNA is not one of those things I understand because it's a bunch of letters and numbers that do not make syllabic sense in my syllabic mind. Um, but when we're looking at DNA, it does have that half-life. And that half-life means that, uh, you know, well, we were able to pull uh, DNA 90,000 years ago out of bone, right? Um, the Denisovian caves, the Denisovian uh, uh, bones that we have are like 90,000 years to 30,000 years ago. Uh, for the longest time, we couldn't test ancient DNA because of what happens when we test DNA. Uh, so if we're taking it from something that's no longer living, we're taking a piece of them and we're grinding it up or dissolving it and mixing it with a solution and then spinning it out and then hopefully getting a couple of threads of DNA from it. But when you test DNA, you need more than a couple of threads to run the test, right? And DNA doesn't dissolve threads, it just shrinks. Um, so our, yeah, DNA itself as opposed to other chemicals. Uh, just shrinks. So when you're looking at ancient DNA, you've got to find a couple of strands. But if you're finding only two strands, you can't even test two. If you find enough for a singular test, it destroys the DNA in the test. You can't retest the DNA. So polymerase chain reaction took the ability to get even a single strand of DNA out of something and then multiply it by millions. So now you can test it. And this is when we started being able to test ancient DNA. Once we started testing ancient DNA on humans um, and hominins, and we were able to figure out a little bit more, then we started expanding into our ancient DNA field. And so within the last two years, I've seen where, um, out, again, out of the Max Planck Institute, uh, one of their people actually was able to take and can now read the genetic code to determine the likely hair, eye, and no shape, lip shape, jaw shape, head shape, body shape, so that they can actually like give us an idea of what Denisovian looked like, even though we don't have a full skeleton of Denisovian. Um, but they've also come up with the ability to test the ground, right? And so now what they're doing, there is the, that one that I was talking about. There's been a couple others that I've seen come across where they've test, tested caves. Um, so I believe that they actually tested the floor of Denisovian cave, and that's where they get the idea that hominins our homo sapiens were actually there as well because they haven't seen homo sapien bones. Um, but that, I mean, they have millions of bones in that cave. It just means that they haven't tested homo sapien bones because there's millions of bones and they're all smaller than this in Denisovia cave. So um, we're looking at that and seeing that in that testing of the ground, we can see what uh, a biome looked like. Uh, see what the animals were like there, what the plants were like there, and kind of rebuild visually or thought process why a biome currently up to 2 million years old. They were actually able to get a, a million-year-old DNA out of a baby mammoth, a juvenile mammoth in a, again, an Arctic tundra. Um, so that one came out like a year ago, but it was they've been talking a lot in the news about uh, what it would be like if we or at least what comes across my feed, because my feed is mostly history and archaeology and science. But they've been talking and BuzzFeed articles. Uh, but we've been talking. They've been talking a lot about, um, you know, can we clone this mammoth? Can we make a new mammoth? Right. And what it would mean and all that sort of stuff. So I've seen a lot of that come across, you know, the science of what we're going to do, because they actually have a whole genome of an ancient mammoth now. They absolutely can find out if Fred was the stinky one in the cave. And really, I mean, that would be a few different things. So if they find Fred, right, um, and they analyze his DNA, they can look in his DNA and see if maybe he was more gaseous than others, right? Um, they can also look at his DNA, not as likely with the DNA, but they could see in the soil what kind of foods they were using, 
right? What kind of herbs they were using. We can also see in teeth. So if we've got a chunk of a tooth, we can see the uh, plaque um, on their teeth. But uh, so they would see what kind of foods they're eating so they could determine whether or not he was making the stink in the cave. And if, say, he's in a cave and it's him and Neanderthals and Denisovians and he's the only homo sapien, they can determine whether the Neanderthals and the Denisovians were more capable of eating the food substances that we found in the cave than Fred was capable of eating the food substances we found in the cave. And therefore, Fred might be the gassy one in the cave. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so DNA, the, the, the advents, the, the bigger things that we have found recently with it are just exponentially informative. Like the information that we had 10 years ago is almost null and void. The information that we had 20 to 30 years ago is almost null and void. Um, some of it is completely null and void. Some of it we're still, that's still what we've got for information, right? Um, but we haven't. Homo sapien becomes the problem roughly 10 to 15,000 years ago. Homo sapien is not the problem until 10 to 15,000 years ago. There is one person who wrote a book called Sapiens that states that we killed off the Neanderthals. Archaeologists don't believe that. Uh, people in the field don't believe we killed off the Neanderthals. And as we're moving along in forward, uh, more and more evidence is stacking up that we actually just enveloped the Neanderthals into us. There were only about 10,000 as a species left by the time that, you know, we left in the Levant and moved into Europe. They'd already been living with us for 100,000 years, side by side in two caves, a five minute walk, um, you know, from each other. Um, they absolutely, um, you know, we get so many genetic things from them and we learn so many things from them, right? Um, there is not a lot of evidence of possible violence in the archeological record prior to 10 to 15,000 years ago. Prior to 10 to 15,000 years ago, the only evidence that we see of violence in the archeological record is something that can be attributed to accidental shit as well. It's not evidence that it's deliberate violence. Um, even sometimes self-inflicted, right? Or just caves collapsing, right? And um, what we see is 2% 2 at 2,000 uh, 2, skeletons or 2,000 bone fragments, basically. Um, but when we're pushing that forward, um, at 15 to 10,000 years ago, we see violence rise. And we see this by like, I think it's 15% to 30%. And in some instances, we see actual evidence of violence. Like it's it, there's nothing else. There's one evidence in Kenya of a pregnant woman tied up, uh, sitting cross-legged and bound before she's killed, which, I mean, can't get more positive evidence than that, right? Um, so we do see that shift, and we see that shift with the narcissistic god kings. We see that shift when possession of the land, possession of anything, really, um, becomes into play or comes into play. When we start being able to devalue things and decide that they don't matter, right? When we start to be able to set ourselves a, a step above the world, a step above the biome, a step above the, those around us instead of a part of, right? Uh, when we start to see those things is when we see a rise of violence, uh, when we see destruction really start to happen. And really, um, that really starts when we see uh, kings developing cities and we see othering starting. Um, the barbarians in the hills are here to steal your food. So pay me and my army and we'll protect you, but we'll also, you know, harm you. Um, when we see, uh, you know, that shift into, you know, I'm in the city, but you're also in a city. So it can't be the barbarians in the hills, but that other city, you know, is not as smart as we are. They're backwards, right? Um, we see that shift into religion. Uh, you know, we're we're this religion and therefore you're that religion and you're sinful because you're that religion shifts into race in 1492 when uh the europeans land in america and start their horror show um and then start stealing people from other countries for that horror show um and when they can no longer really make it about the religion um and then it shifts into um Othering at, based on immigrant status, based on home status, you know, things like that as we move on. Uh, we still have so much othering involved in our societies. Uh, most of our societies are really founded on the idea of othering. Um, that's what nationalism is, right? That's that idea that we're better than something else, right? But that all starts with the idea that we can own land. 
that all starts with the idea that we're separate and above the biome and therefore we can possess the biome, right? That's very true. Um, so we absolutely see it shift now into anybody who's telling you that you should be worrying about anybody else that's not the government. And I don't mean uh, we should write more laws <laughs> to control people because the government's trying to control you, which some people like to take the hate the government to there. I mean, burn it to the ground. I mean that the governmental structure we have on any level is not okay. Yes, peace. In fact, very many of them. Um, to my thought process, if you look at most of those caves, I think it was the flickering of the light on the walls that actually uh, start that spark of imagination then we that we start putting that on the walls. So when we're looking at fire and Homo erectus, again, we're looking at the thing that's the foundation of everything else. And we're looking at something that gives us the brains that we have. So uh, we see that uh, Homo erectus has the, uh, so with the, the ability to cook food, right? Uh, when food is cooked, it's pre-digested and pre-digested food gives a greater caloric intake for a less amount. So you're going to get double your caloric intake on an ounce of food. When that's animal proteins and fats um, and fish proteins and fats, that especially all goes to brain development in utero, neonate, and up to uh, 25 years when our brain fully forms. So when you're getting that excess, that's us now, Probably back then we're looking at 15 years from neonate to fully formed. Um, maybe, I, I'm not sure. But when we're looking at that, that brain development gives us our larger brains and it gives us our smarter brains. So as we're moving along with the ability to control fire, we see that our first evidence of uh, burial actually comes with Homo nilotti. This is a new find from last year. Lee Berger published or put out a thing on this. Um, we see that Homo nilotti uses fire to crawl through extremely narrow tunnels into earthen spaces, put their dead on shelves. They'll eat in an outside cavern or cook food in an outside cavern, but in the cavern inside they have fire and just the, the person on the shelf, right? And they're coming back and they're visiting right? There's long-term fires usage here. So they would come and sit with the fire and their, their relative, their ancestor on the shelf and, and sit, right? Uh, whether they commute, how they did, you know, we're not sure, but they would come and sit. So this is um, that usage of fire showing in that interior cave stuff and showing that shift into the idea of, of more, into the idea of creation, into the idea of, you know, just that idea of self, right? The idea that there is something that lives beyond um, and that idea of self, right? Yes. Yes, that is. That is uh, the rising star caves in South Africa. Lee Berger, B-E-R-G-E-R, -E um, is the lead uh, archaeologist on that. And he put out, and he's got three more things he said is coming out, but he put out a big thing recently. If you look for Lee Berger on the Lottie, and it might actually still be on my website, the Inwood Award site, um, and might actually be a link to that on there, right? Not millions. Uh, 335,000 to 235,000 years ago. So we developed 300,000 years ago to our knowledge, 300,000 years ago, our current knowledge. Uh, when we are developing near where we're developing, Homo nilotti has been around for about 35,000 years. Um, and we're around for about, what is that? Uh, 65,000 years when they're to our current knowledge, due to the limited skeletons that we have found are extinct, right? Yes, yeah, so it's pre-homo sapien, but just pre, and they're there when we're born, right? They watch us born. Now, at the time that they're watching us born, our skulls don't have the same shape as their skulls. And what we're understanding is, it's not until our skulls move into the shape that we have now that, uh, we really get modern man as we know modern man, right? So we, for a long time, thought that the larger brain means the smarter you are. Homo Neanderthal actually has a larger brain than us. And before we move into a thought process of burial, a thought process of cave art, and a thought process of self-decoration, Neanderthal is starting. 
we see that Neanderthal starts this idea of um, burial roughly 90,000 to 100,000 years ago. We see that Neanderthal starts this idea of cave art roughly 63,000 years ago as our current oldest. Um, and that we see self-decoration really starts kind of in between this. Now, my belief on this is that as our great brains are growing, as this curiosity within us is sparking, right? Um, we're sitting in these caves with this fire that is handed down to us, right? And the scenes of the world are playing on the walls around us, right? Um, and as we're seeing the scenes on the wall around us, we're seeing that um, if you're looking at those cave walls, often there are several different uh, rolls of the wall or several different crevices. And if you're looking at it, even without the, the art on it, you're seeing flickering of scenes that we're seeing, right? And at this time, of course, we're very much still connected with the biome. So we're seeing the animals as a part of us and us as a part of the animals. And so as we're becoming a part of the world around us and identifying uh, the idea that there is a sense of self is when we're really seeing that. Um, um, oh, yeah. Your name is not, I'm not even, it's like, I don't know who you are. Oh, wait, I know who you are. Yeah, absolutely. Can you, um, we'll let you ask. We'll let you invite, I don't know. I'm trying to see if I can pull you up without it. Mm -mm. Let's see if that works. Hey. Hey. So I changed my profile picture. It was the peace and truth. And I'm like, I don't know who the fuck you are. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's no cat mom. And yeah. TikTok wants to go back and forth between the name and the nickname. Oh, we have God. no control over it. They just do what they're going to do. Yeah, that's real. So I was discussing this particular find with my son um, and my daughter as well. But, you know, my older kid had a lot more to say about it. We we're talking about. Um, the peopling of the Americas, so to speak. And, and, you know, we're, we watched the special on YouTube. You can watch that special on YouTube. It's a series, um, about that. And that's how I knew that they needed female scientists to come and ex excavate that. It was fascinating. My daughter thought that was cool, but, <laughs> but my son was like, you know, I was talking about, you know, Hey, that was a long time ago. And this is like, they're pre homo sapien. They're not even fully quote unquote human yet. Okay. According to people's opinions, you know, general consensus, socially yeah. speaking. And they had ceremony, they had art, they had tools, they, they had a civilization. Okay. Albeit, you know, very, it was, it was, it was low level, but it was a civilized society. Okay. Yeah. Before we were even human, and we're all sitting here arguing about when Homo sapiens got civilized and who did it first. We we were born civilized. We were born into civilization. One hundred. One hundred. And, and I asked my son. I said, I said, you know, so when do you think? Because this we we had recently talked about the the study of the mammoth bones that were being processed. Was it in San Diego, California? Yep. It's somewhere in California that they found a hundred and thirty thousand year old site where they found evidence that mammoth bones were being processed for marrow. And there's like no mistaking it. It had to have been. Yeah. Right? The Serenity Mastodon. The yeah. Exactly. And I was like, well, that's, that's pretty advanced. That's, that's a long time ago, 130,000 years ago. That's evidence of humans, of people here. Yeah. So I talked to my son and I said, you know, then there's this, this find in Africa so what do you think? How long do you think they stood there? You know what he told me? This is funny. You're going to giggle. He said, our neighbor's cat migrates more. You think people who had ceremony stood in place? That's impossible. That's Agreed. ridiculous to think that they stood still. Of course they migrated from that point. So we were all over the earth. I I'm guessing there was no just one initial homo sapien. 
Um, I don't, it doesn't make sense. So there, okay. So I do believe that we have to come about in the same space to have the, you know, uh, that same genetic evidence. Like if we're, if you develop different species, like Neanderthals and Denisovians develop from the same species in two different places, but they become two separate species, right? Um, because they're adapting to that place. So I do believe that we had to, as sapiens, start in one space, but I don't believe it was oh. one group. It's multiple groups meeting and interchanging. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I, I, there, but there was no one singular Homo sapien. No. Like they, there, no, it was a community. We were born into a community, or our ancestors were born into a community, and we think of them so far away, so long ago, that these weren't people. They, we, we think of them as soulless animals that just, you know, maybe it happened, but no, actually, it was a very gradual process. Oh, I very agree. gradual. I agree. And I just, I think that we need to discuss the fact, you know, just more often that they had spirituality and they, you know, they had souls, man. They had feelings and tools and, you know, customs, I'm sure. Yeah, Absolutely. definitely customs, right? Because yeah. in those caves, they were pretty darn sure that that was a, a burial site. It, it's not like a whole bunch of people died together because it was only like really old and really young. So that's how you knew that that was a burial plot or a burial spot. Yeah. So they they had rituals. They were civilized, and they they weren't almost sapien yet. So. Well, and I wonder if we um. So when they're talking about us developing in South Africa from many different groups, now I, I'm wondering if Nelati is one of the groups that we developed from because they are the first. So they have that Australopithecine upper body and size of skull, right? Homo erectus' skull is bigger even. And Homo erectus has that expedient bipedalism that Nelati has. Um, but I'm wondering if maybe it's like Heidelbergensis, who we think is one of our ancestors, direct, like our parent species, if maybe Heidelbergensis and Nelati are mixing. And so they're developing with the same skull shape as we're seeing in like Nelati and stuff like that, uh, or not Nelati, um, uh, Erectus and stuff like that, that not globe, not the current shape that we have, that globular lobal, but kind of like this. Um, mm -hmm. But they're carrying the gene from Nelati to develop into that globular lobal, right? And I, I wonder sometimes if it, if Nelati wasn't one of our actual like uh, progenitors, right? And that's how, because yeah. we see them during that time period and they have ceremony. Absolutely. That is 100% ceremony to me, right? That is 100. You can't, if you are sitting and communing with your dead, if you are returning to the same place that your dead is in and you've got your dead on a shelf, then you're absolutely performing some manner of ceremony, right? And when we see that translate to burial in Neanderthal and burial in Homo sapien further down the road, um, you know, around the same time we see it translate to burial in Neanderthal. I, I often wonder if it's it's carrying that spark from Nelati. I mean, often, it's only been known for like six months, but if it's carrying that spark from Nelati into as we're passing it down and that's where we get that spark with uh, Neanderthal and we get that spark within us as we're mixing with Neanderthal, right? Because we pull it back in, right? So if Nelati gets it from Erectus, but they're advanced, and then Heidelbergensis yeah. and Nelati are breeding. And then that creates sapien. But Erectus or Heidelbergensis has also passed this gene to Neanderthal. That meeting back again that pulls the Nelati into this, does that spark it in Neanderthal, right? And spark it completely in all of us? I, I you know, there's so much I think Nelati gave us. But I, I really big I think, on human. I, I think we all started there, right? But then we, we kind of, and this is just my thoughts. You're the professional here, not me, okay? But just, you know. Call me out if it sounds ridiculous to you, but like I think that we kind of sprawled out, okay, went whatever direction, okay. Obviously, there was purpose in the directions, you know, and you know, and I'm not going to argue the purpose. It doesn't matter at no. this juncture. Yeah. What does what does matter is that is that we sprawled out, and the way that DNA and I make jokes in your in your life, and I hope you don't mind it when I say, hey, I got a cousin who looks just like that, you know, like or, I saw a guy at the market, you know. But, but, but honestly, the thing of the matter is that there, there are sparks of our ancestors there. You know, we started out in one area and then we went and I said earlier, I said, okay, so if, if, if I take this pitcher of water, okay, and I pour it 
into my glass and then I put lemonade mix in it, right? And you take the same glass of water and you pour it into yours and you put orange drink mix in it. My lemonade didn't make your orange and your orange didn't make my lemonade, but we came from the same water. Yep. We can we can identify a common ancestor, but with how long we've been on different continents all over this earth, we've all changed quite a bit. And, you know, that's that's really cool. Well, I don't understand why people can't be be accepting of that and be I don't I don't understand why we all have to come from the exact same family. Like we, we came from the same root. Right. right. We all came from the same route. We're all related. We are all people. And, you know, but we all created our own societies. We all created our own ceremony. There is that spark, right? Mm -hmm. Like the visiting of our dead and the spirituality and the respect for life. There's a guy that was found in Japan, in fact, and he was missing like a leg, but they found the leg and they put it with him and then they buried him with like a spear or something. So like clearly this dude was like a fisher, right? And and it looks like the he was attacked one. by a shark. Yes, yeah. I remember that. It looks yes. like he was attacked by a shark. His buddies loved him so much that they dove in after this attack, pulled him and his limb that had been taken from his body. Yeah. And buried it with him. That's the level of respect. And that's the spark that lies with all of us. 100. All of us. That's what makes us human. That's what makes us people. And I think it happened before a lot of the genetic changes that made, you know, like you and me, we, we have different facial features. We have different tones of skin. We have different hair, different things. But, but it's that spark right there that makes us people. Yeah. I agree with that. I do. I think, um, so my, and I can't remember, I think it's Maya Angela. I'm going to put it up. I've got a screenshot of it. Uh, said that um, what creates civilization, so many people, like uh, I've said before, some people think civilization starts when uh, we start storing grain. But she says what creates civilization is when you see the mended bone, right? Because uh, animals, when they die, they are when they break a thigh bone, nobody can save them right? They, they just are left, they die, the community moves on. Whereas when uh, humans die, or, you know, our prior species of humans die, uh, or not die, but um, are, injure themselves, when somebody is able to come in and sit with them and hold them and process through that, that's civilization, right? That's humanity. Um, right. Which I think is really important. I do think we're all um, from the same origin, origin, but I think that as we moved yeah. out, we take our cousins in like the Neanderthals in and the Denisovians in. And, and absolutely we know like there's a unique uh, ghost species in uh, Turtle Island indigenous people, right? So absolutely there's a species of Homo erectus that was over there and came here and we enveloped them in. Um, and the same thing with indigenous Australians have that ghost species and then there's the Moyhill site, right? Those sites really double down on the ghost species showing that erectus makes it across and then we have admixture, which is a perfect word in the chat, that admixture. And one thing that um, the person who taught me, and this is how I found out about Nalati, because she was one of the, she's very small, she's Asian, I can't remember if she's Chinese or not, and I don't want to say specifically, because I can't remember, but um, she's a foremost anthropologist on paleoanthropology, and she was one of my teachers, and she's tiny, and she got asked to go out, but she had a new baby, and she's like, I can't. Um, but that's how I found out about Nalati, because they needed those tiny people to go through those very tiny spaces, um, and I think- 18 inches. Yeah. 18 yeah. inches. And it's like, like nine feet long, and one of them, you got to go over a hump and down and around it, and they carried fire through it. They carried torches through it, right? So- like, I think that that's really important that we see that, um, you know, we have an origin point, but that admixture, and that's what she was saying. She's like, we all have admixture. There is not a single person on this planet that doesn't have admixture from other species and other spaces. I do believe yep. that um, once we get to the Turtle Islands for certain groups, it becomes, I think that they're migrating back, right? So I, I do see that yeah, we see the mitochondria. back and forth, right? Right, right. But I, I do think that it becomes a unique, right? I, I always want to make sure and double down on that just because we know there's so much yeah. shit out there, right? But, you know, it becomes that well, unique. again, you know, the pitcher of water and then the lemonade and the orange yeah. drink, right? Yeah, you absolutely. Know, and we become different. But I think that the, but what we're defining as people is what is really separating us. 
because, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm cruising TikTok, you know, and I see some people say that, you know, some other people don't even have souls. And it's like, oh, my God, do you not realize we all do? We all do. We're people. And we were civilized long before we looked like we look today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I feel like we were more civilized. To me, I exactly. feel that community-based uh, interaction, love for each other is way more civilized than anything we have today, right? Right. <laughs> Most of the shit we have right. today has nothing to do with community or civil. Civil. None of it's civil. Nobody's being civil, right? Uh, oh. Yeah. No, I agree with that 100%. And I think that, you know, it's really important as we look at it that we understand that we are, um, that what makes human um, is that nurturing, that community, you know, that, that communal and that nurture is what, what is unique about us. What was unique about N- Nalati, what was unique about Neanderthal is that you had to have that nurture in that community to subsist. Without that nurture or that community, we don't have the, we don't have the spark because we can't survive, right? We don't have that spark of creativity, that spark of understanding that everybody is so proud of as us as a species, right? We don't have that without being nurtured as a child without having a community to nurture us. You know, it's, it's, I agree 100%. People need to understand that better. They need to understand that we've had ceremony and burial and humanity and love for each other and care that medicine is old as Neanderthals, you know, that we had all of these things because we seem to have thought somehow that humane isn't okay. Like, isn't the human trait that we're supposed to be achieving. Right. Like, like we were walking around, we made it all the way to be homo, homo sapiens, and we just someone someday decided, oh, I'm going to be nice. Yeah. No, it didn't happen like that. It did. We couldn't have create. We couldn't have evolved into what we are today without that spark of humanity. You know, you know so many soul. people don't believe we evolved still. Like, so many people still think that the world is 6,000 years old. That we're the pinnacle of evolution. Uh, if they think evolution existed or evolution didn't exist or, you know, or, or think that we're innately evil. Like, we're innately what the Christians tell them we are, you know. And, and so well, many I, people are stuck in that. I believe in guided, I believe in guided evolution. Yeah, that's my personal belief. And I don't push it on anybody. I am Christian, but I believe in guided evolution. And I I also accept the fact that I don't know everything. Right. And my way isn't the only way. Yeah. You know, I I, I, I can't say because I don't know I wasn't there when we were all created. But I can say that I love society and I love humanity and I love what, what we've become. Although there are some flaws, we have some issues. But I think with time, maybe not in your lifetime, maybe not in my lifetime, maybe not in my kid's lifetime. We'll, we'll sort it out. Yeah. And then, you know, m- millions of years from now, you know, our descendants will be like, uh, you know, and they only had two arms and two hands and we got thumbs, you know, coming out of our ears or whatever. They'll look different than us and that's okay. Breathe different than us for <laughs> sure, you know. God, I hope. We can only <laughs> hope. No, and I agree with that. Down. Okay. That is a fascinating find. Yeah. Fascinating. I love that find. The shark find too. The shark find was pretty epic. And I mean, yes, I, they dove in after a, after a shark just demolished their buddy. And grabbed the leg. They had to dive in and, and get him and his leg. Grab the leg. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my God. And had some idea that he might need this in the afterlife. Right. Like right. to put exactly. it with him, like there's some idea of you want to go whole into the afterlife so you can walk in the afterlife. Right. I I, um, I know a lot of people who look at it as uh, evolution with a helping hand, and I don't have a problem with that. I personally uh, don't believe in a, a higher deity, higher power, or an omnipotent deity, but um, I can absolutely understand the theory and the thought process that it is about, uh, you know, there is an influence over it, um, however that influence comes about for a person. And... I have a problem with the way uh, religion, organized religion as a whole, uh, has caused destruction. Um, I don't usually have a problem with individuals of any religion, right? Especially not individuals that are uh, pushing, or individuals that aren't pushing anything, right? Uh, I totally don't have a problem with people's beliefs. Um, I have a problem sometimes when people's beliefs lead them down, like Westboro Baptist Church, fuck you. God didn't say that anyways. Um, but, you know, uh, 
I don't have a problem with individuals. And I know that sometimes my rhetoric may come across that way or the things that I say, um, but usually I'm talking as a whole and as what has happened as a result of, um, I don't think that, um, to my thought process, Christ taught love and uh, people, <laughs> the vast majority of people who say that, you know, they follow Christ don't actually follow Christ's teachings, right? Uh, but I also know a lot of people who, follow Christ's teachings of love to a, a very accurate and very uh, loving way, right? Um, I personally believe Christ existed. I'm not sure if I believe that he was the son of God. I believe that he existed, though, and I believe that he was trying to get his religion back on, or his people back on the path that he believed that they were supposed to be on. Um, I believe that his words have been twisted by a lot of people, but for me, every prophet that I've ever read from Muhammad to Christ, to Christ, um, to, you know, prophets down the way. Well, not every prophet. I don't think Joseph Smith was really about love except for free love and sex, but uh, <laughs> the vast majority of prophets have been teaching about love, right? Um, to me, uh, love is a higher power. Like that is the deity to me. Uh, I think love is energy. And I think that we are all energy, right? Uh, but even in that, my thought process of how we come about is still almost a creation uh, with evolution, because my thought process of us is that we're manifestations of ourselves, right? That I believe that we're all a gigantic pink floating ball of energy <laughs> and three sparks or three, or, uh, three cells fire here, create synapses here and three here and three here. And once you get a multiple, you get a conscious. And once you get multiple consciousnesses, you manifest reality is my belief system on it personally. But I totally view that as the same teachings of love that I read in the Quran and the same teachings of love that Christ teaches in the Bible, not necessarily uh, Yahweh's behavior, but Christ's behavior within the Bible. And so I want to make sure, because I do know that I seem very I am very anti-Christian. I'm just not very anti-specific Christians, right? Like if you actually follow Christ, I'm good, <laughs> you know? Um, but I think that when we're looking at the advent of civilization, I don't think that this is going to pause me, but let me warn you in case it does, because I just did not. Okay. It was Margaret Mead. Sorry about the pause of my voice to uh, the phone call tried to come in. It was Margaret Mead, not Maya Angelou. Margaret Mead has said this, and she said that the first sign of civilization is where you see a broken bone that has been healed, right? Um, and that to me makes perfect sense for the reasons that she states in here. She says, if you break your leg, you die. You cannot run from danger, get to the river for a drink or hunt for food. You are meat for prowling beasts. No animal survives a broken leg long enough for the bone to heal. A broken femur that has healed is evidence that someone has taken the time to stay with the person and has bound up the wound, has carried the person to safety, has tended the person uh, through recovery, Helping someone else through difficulty is where civilization starts. Um, I actually screenshotted this earlier because I'm going to do a video of it, but I love this. Um, and this is probably going to pause me again as I or appear to pause me. Okay. So. I totally think that um, that is something we absolutely see, not only in um, Nalati, but us, like the shark um, attack, like the 31,000 year old foot amputation in Borneo. Uh, we absolutely see that uh, there is that understanding. Now we do see a shift. So in Homo erectus, uh, we don't really see that a whole lot. We don't see a healing of bones in Homo erectus uh, finds that we have. Now, that can mean that uh, most Homo erectus we have finds we have are in uh, cave-ins, collapses, floods, things like that. Um, and so 
uh, because they didn't bury their dead. Um, to our knowledge so far, maybe we don't see with Homo erectus, you know, an elder who's died uh, and has been actually buried, right? Maybe they, maybe they buried their dead, but they didn't do it in a cave. Maybe they tossed their dead in the water. Maybe they put their dead up in trees. Like there might be different ways that they buried that don't actually like transfer over into the fossil record. Um, but because we haven't found like a burial of it, of Homo erectus, and because we haven't found something like healed fractures and stuff like that, uh, we do not believe that they had medicine or that they uh, buried their dead to our knowledge so far. Again, shit's changing all the time. This could change really quickly. Uh, we do see with Neanderthal, though, that start of medicine. We do see that um, they used herbs. And you can see uh, in the plaque on their teeth that they used herbs that were very bitter and had no caloric properties. So they're not using them as food, but they're used for uh, associated disease processes we see in the body. Um, and we absolutely see that Homo sapien and Homo sapien sapien, right? Because it is a little distinct between the older Homo spe sapien species and us. Uh, we consider it modern human versus uh, the older Homo sapien once we see that fully formed shift of the brain. Uh, but we start to see burial and cave art before that anyways. Um, so I would state that those are, you know, the start of the species as it is today, right? But when we see that, we absolutely see um, burial, cave art, uh, decoration of self, um, and we absolutely see surgeries. We absolutely see healing. We absolutely see herbology, right? And we see with um, Kreb, uh, Shanidar one that uh, he had he needed to be tended and cared for. Like to our knowledge, um, his injuries aren't necessarily ones that like I think that his arm is, sh is shriveled because of a birth accident, or maybe it's because of a cave in or stoving in of his head. So there is what looks to be where like a, a rock hit his head or where his head was uh, like you know maybe he was in a cave collapse and it hit or even somebody hit him with a rock. We don't know, right? Um, but there seems to be a cave in on the left side um, and it affected the left or the right side, it affected the right eye, it affected the right hearing. Uh, he was fully blind and fully deaf on this side and then partially deaf on this side. Um, and then his arm was shriveled up, which could be uh, due to nerve damage because of a skull injury. Uh, it's also the right leg that shriveled up to my memory. Uh, and so again, it could be due to the brain damage with the skull injury, or it could be due to, uh, I think, most understanding thinks that it has to do with that and the other understanding thinks that it has to do with a birth defect right but either way we're looking at somebody who was tended and cared for so that head injury they had to be nursed back to health right um and they uh you know they use like a we assume a stick because of markings here right or on the bone um like a the regrowth or the like the heavier muscle attachments in specific ways on the bone. Um, they think that he used some form of a crutch, but even then you're not getting around very easily. And this is 90,000 years ago, Kreb is, I think. Um, so when we're looking at that, we're seeing that we see that civilization in prior homo species. We see that civilization, that thought process of taking care of each other, that thought process, that community is important, right? Uh, we absolutely see that prior to us. That's one thing I really like to double down, and we haven't talked about with the Borneo find for a while. A lot of people, first let me explain the Borneo find. The Borneo find is a 31,000 year old full foot amputation in Borneo. Um, the person was genetically female, roughly 19 years old when they died. And the healing of the bone shows that they were alive for six to nine years before they died. So we're looking at this as something that happened early on in, uh, or in the early to mid teens, right? And so as we're looking at this, we're seeing uh, that somebody had to, so if you don't know, obsidian is, such a hard stone that when it's uh, worked or napped, you can get such a fine blade on it that you can cut through cells or not through cells, between cells, right? So obsidian blades are something that like really big surgeons, microsurgeons, things like that will use even today. But an obsidian set of scalpels is like top shelf. Like that's the prime that you can get because of the fineness that you can cut with them. Um, and when we're looking at the fineness of this cut, 
you can see that um, it was an obsidian blade used. It's an extremely fine cut. You see that um, to actually perform a lower limb amputation, we know medically that you have to have some form of painkiller. You have to have some form of anesthesia because if somebody is awake during a lower limb amputation, the shock of losing a limb, a lower limb, which we associate with our ability to move, uh, the shock of losing a lower limb and the shock from the surgery itself will kill somebody. We know that during the Civil War, people who survived lower limb surgeries were because they either had morphine or they were passed out or unconscious during the surgery. Uh, and so we know that this person most likely had some form of anesthesia. There's anesthetic or anesthesia based herbs, painkiller herbs in the area that they are most likely using to uh, knock the patient out or sedate the patient during surgery. We also know that they knew enough about uh, the anatomy of the lower limb that they um, had a way to cauterize or tie off. I'm assuming cauterize, but I do like to mention the possibility of get cat gut and tie off um, of the blood vessels. And then they had enough knowledge of making sure that this healed properly, that they actually would have had the skin flap. Like, so at this point, what you would do in a surgery, even today, is you're going to pull the flesh up as you slice so that when you release it, the flesh goes down past the end of the bone. And then if you're really smart or um, in surgeries today or in heal surgeries that really heal well, um, don't run the risk of infection and stuff like that. What you do is when you're pulling the skin up, you're cutting to leave a flap of skin as well, right? So that when it comes down, not only does it cover the end of the bone, but you can flap it and sew it, right? So that the bone isn't exposed, so that the meat of the body isn't exposed. And we know that something like this had to have happened because there's no sign of infection in the bone and because they lived six to nine years. It also tells us that they likely used antiseptic herbs as well, of which there are also antiseptic herbs in the area. This again is 31,000 years ago. This is, you know, really old. We didn't think that we had these kind of, this, I've been in and out surgeries. I did uh, fluoro for surgeries. I was a radiographer before I did archeology. span And this is more beautiful than we do in surgeries today. Today, when we're doing surgeries, we use tools from Home Depot. <laughs> we use skill saws from Home Depot and hammers. Um, of course, things are surgical steel, right? And, you know, things, you know, um, but we are still using these very rudimentary tools for surgery, right? And there's been a lot of advances in the last five years. And it's been a good 10 years since I was in a surgery. So, you know, we might be doing them better now. Um, but we absolutely have this very rudimentary understanding of surgery today that apparently they had a better understanding of surgery in Borneo at 31,000 years ago. Um, this is one of those signs of civilization. This is one of those understandings that we are looking at a group that has science and has medicine. You don't perform a perfect fucking surgery your first time. Okay. That just doesn't happen. Especially if nobody's ever performed a surgery before, right? Nobody's ever amputated a foot before. You don't do it perfectly the first time. You're going to lose a few people right? You're going to, you know, so this tells us that at least for this generation, this person themselves had done this a couple of times before, most likely because there's not a whole lot of prevalence of need for an amputation in a group of like 30 or 40. Um, most likely we're looking at something that is a couple of generations of training, is a couple of generations of knowledge. Um, because again, if you've never seen a surgery before, if you don't know what a surgery is, you're not performing a picture perfect, accurate to the T better than today's surgery, <laughs> your first time out the gate with a patient that survives for six to nine years. So this is absolutely not only a sense of community uh, and a sense of civilization, but it's also a sense of a broader scale of civilization. It's not that this group of roughly to 100 people was the civilized group and no other groups were civilized. It was that this group knew this group and this group and the knowledge from this group for a couple of generations and this group for a couple of generations taught this group for a couple of generations, right? 
And so that constant intermix, we are always intermixing. There is not a period of our world that we are not intermixing. And it is that constant intermix, that constant admixture, that constant exchange of information and knowledge that is us, right? So Homo erectus' ability to make across the globe that they pass down to us, right? That ability to dig into every place you go and sink your sink your toes into the earth and really adapt to every place that you go um, and really develop in every place that you go. It's very part of us and Homo erectus, right? And it is that with that creativity and that spark with Homo erectus that really drives us forward, right? That we are really feeling even today. Like that is really everything even today. Now, as we're moving, constant admixture, constant exchange of information, constant exchange of DNA, even between cousin species, right? As we're doing this, it is... As I often say, when this box meets this box, that a whole new box forms, right? So it is the need of a group sitting for 10,000 years in a space and forming a new understanding of that space, meeting another group that sat for 10,000 years in another space, forming an understanding of that space, coming together and going, well, my space has rivers, my space has mountains. What happens when we mix mountains and rivers, right? You know, I mean, obviously most mountains have rivers, but you know, this understanding that sparks here, right? I personally believe that it is the meeting of Homo sapien and Homo erectus um, and living side by side for, or not Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalus, and living side by side in those two caves in the Levant that gives us both that movement forward, right? If we don't see, so if we start living side by side with the Neanderthals at 150,000 years ago, and Neanderthals and us both start burial roughly 100,000 years ago, right? This tells me that that meeting creates that sense of me and you, right? Not that sense of me versus you, not that sense of um, me here, you there, you know, but that sense of me and you, right? That sense of um, I'm going to have an identity that is mine, right? And you're going to have an identity that is yours, but our identities mix and match. That's to me that start. Um, I think that when I'm looking at those things, that when I um, see that, I see us. I think that No Cap was right when they were saying, you know, people like to think that, you know, it's all, you know, in a cave and it's not, right? People like to think that, um, again, to be human is to be nurturing and communal. And a human is homo. Any homo species is human. To be human is to be nurturing and communal, right? It is the need for multiple people to create a safe space, right? And I firmly believe that Neanderthal and early homo sapien and erectus had safer space than modern human today has ever found, right? If your family has been able to occupy the same cave for a hundred generations, right? Uh, you know, or even 10 generations, right? That's a pretty secure spot. There's not a lot of people in today's world that have been on the same piece of earth in the same space for 10 generations, right? Um, when you have that ability to be in that same space, A, you're understanding everything about you, but home is home on a level that most of us perceive today, but can't find today, right? Um, to me, early Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, um, actually have more civilization than we do because they have more safety than we do. And lots of people like to think, oh, you know, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, right? Most animals aren't going to approach a fire. Very few animals will approach a cave that has a fire in it. Um, most animals don't really approach humans, right? Uh, so you're not going to get so much that worry that it 
large cat's going to come into your cave when you have a fire there, especially not if you've built some form of a covering over the mouth of them. And absolutely, we see evidence of that. We actually see evidence of like rock walls built halfway across an opening or something like that. Um, and so, and, and that's like in Neanderthals and Homo erectus, this goes back, right? So when we're looking at that, we really want to understand that just like 50 years ago, we didn't understand we didn't have a phone, right? Or a cell phone. Oh God, maybe it's not 50 years ago anymore. Early cell phones are 80s and that's, I guess that's 40 years ago, right? So, you know, maybe, you know, a hundred years ago, we can conceptualize this, but that doesn't mean a hundred years ago that they felt the lack of this, right? We think that people living in caves are going to feel the lack that we personally would feel if somebody picked us up and moved us in a cave. But they don't know the internet exists. They don't give a flying fuck, right? They're sitting in the cave watching the firelight play on the walls. And I totally believe it is that play of that firelight across the walls that totally gives us that concept of cave art. I honestly believe that when they were drawing on walls, what they were drawing was what they saw in the firelight, what they saw flicker across the walls because of the way the cave walls sat, right? And I absolutely believe that that is a huge part of that understanding of creativity. It is a huge part of that movement forward. And it is a huge part of that concept of us, right? I still think that we don't see that shift of us as being outside the biome, unique, special, set above until we start to see that ownership of land, till we get this concept of tilling the earth. I own this property, this is mine, and now I'm gonna till it up, right? It, it's the first property we see, it's the first ownership we see, right? Um, we had a little bit of Homo erectus, but not as much, and that's okay. I'm going to go ahead and head out because I've been on for a couple hours. Um, I will probably not be back until Sunday, uh, Pacific Standard Time, uh, but I will be back roughly Sunday. Um, I might be on a little bit tomorrow. It just depends on what my life looks like. I want everybody to take care. Um, I want everybody today to remember that they are worthy and necessary uh, for our forward movement as a species. If, especially if you're one of the groups of people that feel that this isn't right, that we're not in the right space, that, that you know, depressed or overwhelmed or, you know, things like that, you are necessary and valued because it is that understanding that this is not what we should be that is going to help change us. Love you all so much. You guys have a great afternoon, evening. Um, and if I don't see you tomorrow, have a great weekend. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye, YouTube.